Welcome to episode 25 of the Serial Chillers podcast. I am your host, Jesse, and thank you guys so much for tuning in. Today, I have two in-studio guests with me. I've got newcomer Jeff, who is brand new to the show, but not new to my heart, and returning for the first time, second episode, John is here. He's still looking to buy up studio uh, naming rights, so we'll see if we let him in on that one this week. Make sure you give us a rate, review, and subscribe if you are an iTunes user, and get ready for today's crazy, fucked-up story of the Toolbox Killers, Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris. Sit back, relax, and enjoy episode 25 of the Serial Chillers podcast. Of one, what, Greg? What, wait. No, just nothing. Nothing is good, or uh, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. wear like, nothing. Yeah, don't, don't wear anything. I, That's what no. I was All right. Anyway, okay, okay, cool. Welcome to episode twenty-five of One Million of the Serial Chillers podcast. I am here with two guests in studio tonight, and as always, across the internet, producer Greg. What's up, Greg? Hello. Yes, Greg is always across the internet, always doing. Greg thinks so. Uh, Greg's gonna be here I'm in tonight. A sealed bunker underground. Yes, Greg's gonna be here tonight. He's not gonna be playing the game. He is just going to be uh, quote unquote producing. And to my left, I have a longtime friend, Jeff. Hello, oh. <laughs> my name's Jeff. <laughs> my name's Jeff. <laughs> and returning to the show from I cannot remember what episode. I should have looked it up. So I seemed like I knew my shit. Old John. Old John, yeah, man. Mine was Suge Knight and the oh, Briley brothers. I, I, re- I was trying to remember the number. Yeah. I totally remember the subject I matter. Yeah, mm-hmm. see, you don't know shit either. Um, <laughs> John is still looking into uh, buying the rights for naming the studio. We're discussing some things. So uh, maybe next episode we'll bring out some uh, John Loico studio talks. As, as of right now, though, we're still, uh, it's still kind of a middle thing. Don't be like the Browns and file late. <laughs> so, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, each week, I sit down with old friends, new friends, good friends, and bad friends to tell the story of an infamous serial killer. Throughout the show, you guys will chime in on my story, and if you brought them, have stories of your own that are true crime, dark, creepy, unsolved, or otherwise mysterious. I don't think we have any guest stories today. That's okay. This is a long one. Lastly, you guys, if you have questions about the questions, make sure to ask questions because I cannot answer questions about questions if you never ask questions. Any questions? Roger that. Welcome to, and let's play, the Serial Chillers Podcast. Uh, Today, you guys, I have a serial killer duo for you. Uh, Do we each get one person? How funny, John. I think I've done three episodes where there's more than one killer involved, and you were on one of them. Yeah. How about that? Now you're on two. Okay. Today's killers, you guys, Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris. Wouldn't it just be like the worst spoiler if one of us knew everything about one of these serial killers you were going to do? I'll tell you, the two episodes where somebody's been insanely confident about, oh shit, they have gotten absolutely destroyed. If you do know, because you've been on the show, Jeff, you probably don't. This is the first question every single time. I don't expect you to know the answer, but it's always fun to start. In what year is Lawrence Bittaker born? The closest to the answer is going to get 250 points. Please write down your answers. John's got his answer in. I can tell by the look on your face that I hit it on the nose. Is that right? Wow, you guys guessed incredibly close. Jeff said 1918. John said 1919. (laughs) John's going to get the 250 points. Lawrence Bittaker (sighs) was born September 27th, 1940 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The crowd goes wild. I just figured Bittaker, that had to... That's I can't. <laughs> that surname is surely an old one. I well, feel like I should have been more organized with my answer writing on the paper here. John's going to start out with a 250-point lead. And we do have Lawrence Bittaker born uh, September 27th, 1940 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He is adopted by Mr. and Mrs. George Bittaker, who he refers to as a distant aunt and uncle. Uh, his parents gave him up after he turned two years old, too. That was kind of another thing I found interesting. Jeff, I know you have a, a kid, and I have a couple of kids myself. I can't imagine giving one away after. I mean, look, adoption, like, if you realize you can't take care of a kid, you probably should give it up for adoption. Oh, so his, his parents did give him up after he turned two years old. His adoptive parents moved around quite a bit. Um, in his first five years, he lived in Pennsylvania, Florida, Ohio, and they finally land in Richmond, California. 
Um, so he lived a very unsettled childhood. He didn't have a lot of time to like plant any roots. He didn't make friends. And if he did make friends in the short time, they were staying in place. It was, it was always uproot and, and go. So he had a very, um, unstable upbringing that doesn't, I, I didn't get much about any type of abuse or neglect or anything like that. He didn't feel, uh, very loved. He even has a quote where he says, uh, like how much of a lonely child he was. And I, you know, you were on the Briley brothers episode. They're treated like gigantic pieces of shit as well. And mm-hmm. that's kind of the case with almost every single killer we dive into is that they're, you know, there's some, and for him, there was nothing really other than the, the moving around a lot and the, and you know, it was weird. It's almost like there's a commonality between what makes people serial what? killers. Well, now I was an only child and <laughs> I was in custody of uh, different places. I didn't go to different towns, but right. I mean, I was lonely, but I didn't, I didn't murder people because of it. I'm glad like, you're the not, exception. I'm glad you're the exception. Let's not just go down that path where there's like, hey, there's this pattern with these serial killers, <laughs> you see. This, this is just the beginning. <laughs> well, what, what we were saying is there's more like a lot of these have the patterns and he, he didn't have the patterns initially to fit it uh except for the being uprooted which i'm glad you made it through jeff i'm glad you're yeah, here no, with us. of course i'm not strong. murdering anyone oh, yeah. no i had you i had you though there, there you're like no the later I'm, years no, so it was, it was all right i'm really strong <laughs> super so in 1957 uh bitteker drops out of school uh soon thereafter in 1957 he is arref- arrested for auto theft and hit and run and evading arrest in long beach california Two years later, in 1959, he is released from the California Youth Authority. So he had just turned 19 at this time. August 1959, two months after being released, um, he is convicted of interstate motor vehicle theft and sentenced to serve 18 months at a federal reformatory in Oklahoma and transferred to the U.S. Medical Center in Springfield, Missouri for good behavior uh, at the federal reformatory in Oklahoma. So he's... Showing some good behavior in Oklahoma. They move him over to Springfield, Missouri, because what a good guy he's being. In 1960, he's released by doctors from the U.S. Medical Center in Springfield. And December of that year, he is arrested in Los Angeles for robbery. He cannot um, stay out of the system. That's just sort of... uh, Bitteker's, this is all by the time he's like, what, 20 years old? Yeah, exactly that. He was released and rearrested at 20. So we're at 20 now. So he's 21 here. He's convicted in the L.A. robbery and, and given in for Jerry Brown. <laughs> this is given <laughs> an indeterminate sentence of one to 15 years in a state prison. So one to 15 years uh, in 1961 at 21. He is diagnosed with borderline psychotic and basically paranoid while in state prison said to be, be manipulative and a great deal of pent up hostility. He's a uh, he's, <laughs> he's 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 it's it's a. Uh, He's a firecracker. That's kind of his deal. It's, his whole life has has been uh, him fighting back. He's hostile because uh, he likes to do bad things and he's terrible at it. Yeah, like he just keeps exactly. Getting caught. exactly. <laughs> That's why he's all hostile. That's kind of another thing too. Is a lot of serial killers become serial killers because they feel invincible. They do all these crimes mm. and they never get caught. And they're like, "Who the f- I can do whatever I yeah. want." And, and then this they guy, do get caught. And right. they're like, "Well, I'm not gonna get caught yeah. again." This guy gets caught every single every goddamn time. Every time. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I will assure just you, the by worst the end criminal of this, ever. He will have killed someone. So in 1962, uh, this would be the worst show about serial killers in the world if he had never killed anybody. <laughs> hey, yeah, I said there were two of them. Uh, <laughs> he's diagnosed. Oh, sorry. Uh, in 1962, a psychiatrist noted him as having quote poor control of impulse behavior end quote like we were just saying. In 1963, he's paroled after serving barely one sixth of his possible maximum sentence. So that was a. Uh, a little less than three years he spent on that one to 15 year sentence. In 1964, he is jailed for a parole violation and suspicion of robbery. Like the easiest way to avoid <laughs> jail. Just just follow your parole instructions. You know what I mean? Like, just at least do that. That's it. That's, that's all. all you have to do, man. So to- and like most people that violate parole don't even get caught. This guy is so <laughs> shitty at being a criminal. He can't even violate parole without getting arrested. Step one of not getting caught. Is don't do it. Yeah, that's true. Boom. Never rob a house for yeah, your first time. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so in 1966, at 26, he is diagnosed again as borderline psychotic in jail and bragged about how stealing cars made him feel important. 
He also said that he felt as if he were misunderstood, mistreated, and falsely accused his whole life. And while he was there, medication was administered. Nice. Later in 1966, he is released from jail. And in 1967, at 27, he is going to have a major event happen in his life. Question number two. Puberty. What is the first major thing to happen to Bideker after his release? This is multiple choice, guys. So, guess number A is he meets a girl. Two, he has an illegitimate child. I said A, too. <laughs> C, parole violation. Or D, he gets a new job. Meets a girl, A, has an illegitimate child, B, violates parole again, C, or he gets a new job, finally, D. Got John's answer. And got Jeff's answer. John said A, meets a girl. Jeff said D, gets a new job. You guys should have gone with history. Because in 1967, Lawrence Bittaker has a parole violation right wow. after he gets out and he's convicted of theft and leaving the scene of a hit and run accident where he received another five year prison sentence. Yeah, I wouldn't even consider that like a like um, a life event at this point. Yeah. I feel like that's like a Tuesday by now, you know? Yeah, I figured that he gets the job and it leads him into his life of Ooh, butchering. This is actually, he, that's kind of close to true so he receives a five-year sentence in 1970 he's paroled after serving less than three years on march of 1971 he's arrested for burglary and parole violation on october 1971 he is convicted on both counts and receives an additional sentence of six months to 15 years in 1974 he's arrested for assault with intent to commit murder Mm. Bideker had stolen meat from a supermarket, put it down his pants, and walked out. A store employee went outside to confront Bideker, and the employee was immediately stabbed. See, see, James, somebody already did it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, in 1974, he was sent to the California Men's Colony at San Luis Obispo. Represent in, hometown, yeah. yay, yay. <laughs> in, in 1978. <laughs> Uh, he met Roy Norris at California Men's Colony. The two claimed to be soulmates and never left one another's side after getting comfortable. They shared the same fantasies of domination through rape and torture. They made plans to have some, quote, fun after being released from prison. They planned to kill young women ages 13 to 19 every year of being a teenager. They wanted one of each age, 13 to 19. Each? How do you get to that conversation? Is what like are you, you, you like playing some dominoes? And, That's what yeah. I never. It's, it always comes down to like that it being some kind of sexual fulfillment, and I never like. Okay, so, I mean, a couple of years ago, you couldn't get a woman to leave the lights on during <laughs> during sex, and now you got them. They want. I mean, they want to, to choke me. You know, it's like yeah. I. There are. It's why? for sure. It's well, a, you have to ease keep, into that conversation. Yeah, but, you know, yeah. it's like, hey, check that chick out. Exactly. She's fine. She's like twenty five, and it's like, yeah, but wouldn't she be cool if she was eighteen? <laughs> nah, dude, fourteen. Like, you know what well, I mean? Like actually, that's a slow progression. Yeah. You know. Well, uh, maybe it was like, well, what year did you start enjoying your abuse? Well, about fourteen. Uh, that's that's. But see, like I was saying, like a chick, like you got to get to the point. You got to ease into just asking somebody to choke you or something like that. How do you get into like? You like killing people? <laughs> yeah, I'd love to rape them and torture too. Yeah, I like a time up real good with the pig hide, you know. <laughs> it, it's I don't know how it gets there, but it does. So let's let's look into Roy Norris's early life a little bit. Uh, question number three: What year is Roy Norris born? So they meet in prison and they become buddies. I mean, they could be twenty years apart. Their closest gets two hundred and fifty points. John says 1955, Jeff says 1946, and Roy Norris is born February 2nd, Groundhog Day, 1948. I couldn't remember Greeley, what year they Colorado. were in prison. I'm trying to do math, and I should have asked you. <laughs> I might have given you that answer. So he was born in 1948 in Greeley, Colorado. Jeff is going to get on the board, 250 at question number three. We've got a tie at 250 apiece. Um not a lot about Roy Norris, Norris's upbringing. It's also said to have been not incredible, but that, uh, you know, it, that doesn't, my, I feel like my upbringing wasn't incredible. Um, 
and here here I, we are. I feel like a good upbringing really is not incredible. Right. Well, you know? that's what I'm saying. Like that's it's like you learn yeah. how to grind through life with a good upbringing and yeah. that's not incredible. Yeah. So in 1965 at 17, Roy Norris also drops out of high school and joins the Navy. In 69, four years later, he spends four months in Vietnam, but never saw combat. Um, Later in 69, while in Vietnam, he starts to use marijuana and enjoy himself. In November of 69, in San Diego, California, he forced himself into a woman's car and attempted to rape her uh, while he was free on bail from from another arrest. In 1969... uh, he received an administrative discharge from the Navy for psychological problems. May 1970, at 22, he attacked a young female student on campus of SDSU in San Diego and clubbed her with a stone, then slammed her head repeatedly into the concrete sidewalk. He is charged with assault with a deadly weapon. So, <laughs> Which was the deadly weapon, the stone or the sidewalk? Either way, he got, he got it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> two, two sure. deadly weapons. We got that. In in 1970 at 22, he is confined to a Tascadero State Hospital as a mentally disordered sex offender. Greg's all stoked. These are all right down the street. From oh, him. yeah. They're in Greg's hood right yeah. now. Yeah, Tascadero. Let's yeah. go there. In 1975 at 27, he is released on probation, and doctors claimed he was no longer a danger to others. Only after being released for three months, question number four, Roy Norris commits a crime. What is that crime? Does he A, rape a woman after strangling her with her own scarf? Does he B, snatch a woman's purse and try to also pretend to be the man who helped capture the guy who stole the purse? Does he C, rob a bank with fake dynamite? Or D, another rock attack like in 1970? That's a sweet scenario, right? Snatch a purse, run run around the corner, change clothes. John's got A, rapes a woman after strangling her with her own scarf. Jeff's got B, Snatch a woman's purse and try to also pretend to be the man who helped to capture it. But the points will go to John today. He did, in fact, attack a 27-year-old woman and strangled her with her own scarf and then raped her. He is convicted of forcible rape and shipped to the California men's colony at San Luis Obispo. See, I'm answering if it was like it was me. That's the problem here. Yeah. Like, that's what I would have done. <laughs> <laughs> so Jeff misses points on that one. John strikes for another two fifty. I was so close to picking the other rock attack. You yeah. know what I mean? Because oh, yeah. it's so like I put it in there. I like to throw the curve man, ball. Man, that you. pattern. Exactly. You know? It was too much. <laughs> I'd be the worst. To he take already it knows he can use the concrete. <laughs> <laughs> he learned. Yeah. So maybe let's... the scarf wouldn't be a deadly Why weapon. Did they even bring you know the I mean? stone. <laughs> let's, let's, there's stone on the ground built in. Uh, let's talk a little bit about when the two meet in this men's colony in San Luis Obispo. Bittaker and Norris initially became loosely acquainted in 1977, one year after Roy Norris arrived at San Luis Obispo. Bittaker's initial impression of Norris upon his arrival at the California men's colony was that he was a savvy individual who largely associated with hardened criminals from motorcycle gangs, in addition to dealing in contraband drugs. The pair gradually became more closely acquainted and only began talking in friendly terms when, question number five, what hobby do they become acquainted over? You can stab at this one, because you got to think prison. There's not a ton of hobbies that you have. If you stab at it, so no multiple choice options, and you get it, it's worth a 1,000 points. But if you take the stab, you don't get to guess on the multiple choice. So they got acquainted over a hobby. Yes. So if you, if you want to stab at it, write it down now. If you want to hear the multiple choice options, I'll give them to you guys. But they got acquainted over a hobby in prison. Can I take a stab at it and then hear the multiple choice options? You can hear them, but you can't answer again. Hi. What are you doing? I don't know. I'm probably going to wait for the multiple choice. I just, I've got to make up some some serious. Oh, you're only down by 250, oh, and there's 12 questions. So let's, just, let's go with the multiple. Ah. Like, I know what hobby I'd like to get acquainted over in prison, but let's just <laughs> I mean, hear yeah. let's hear the multiple, multiple choice, because apparently I'm weird. I feel like, Jeff, your hobby's not going to be on here. No, probably not. What, so what hobby do they become acquainted over? The thousand-point option is eliminated. Is it A, basketball, B, weightlifting, C, reading, or D, jewelry making? Basketball, weightlifting, reading, jewelry making. For 250 points, you guys can both score on this one. Jeff says jewelry. John says reading. Jeff's going to tie it back up. Oh, yes. Norris taught Bittaker how to construct jewelry, 
And according to Norris, Bittaker saved him from being attacked by fellow inmates on two separate occasions. By 1978, the pair had become close acquaintances. Aren't you so glad you didn't stab at that? I find it hard to believe your instinct would have been jewelry. It definitely wasn't. (laughs) Uh, Especially since how they were soulmates. Um, How'd they figure that out? Over, but they, over they definitely bracelets. wasn't going to be reading. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> right. they both dropped out of high school, right? Or dropped out the of school. The thing no? is, they're both. Right. I put reading because they're both psychologically uh, out there. I don't even know so. if it's that. I think they're just really weird, horny men. Well, Lawrence Bittaker actually was tested. He was in prison forever, and he he was he was tested by the federal system that he was in uh, at an IQ of one thirty eight. Yeah, uh, way above average, and. Um, they gave him the test to become a federal prison guard. Just, you know, just the, for shits the, and giggles. He scored higher than anybody who had ever taken the test. So, yeah, yeah see, the type of people, pretty, I don't assume they're not intellectual people. You know what oh, I mean? Oh, no, we're not. I mean, they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, I mean,. Uh, I mean, but you, like, and you know, too, with an IQ of 138, that doesn't even necessarily mean he's intellectual. It, it means. Uh, it could. It very well could. And he's, he, 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 in a in a dirty, rotten way, kind of is. Um, let, we'll move on. We'll but an IQ test is so much related around like problem solving right. and mathematical. Right. So it doesn't. Yeah. The guy might not know how to fucking. Well, and read, aren't there know? literally thousands of different IQ? Some are more geared towards. So yeah, you, you're totally right. He probably could have just got one that you know fit right into his into his niche. So uh, by 1978, the pair had become very close acquaintances and discovered they shared in common an interest in sexual violence and misogyny with Norris also divulging to Bittaker. The biggest stimulation for him was of seeing frightened young women's faces, adding this was the primary reason he had amassed a lengthy record for sexual offenses. Bittaker, who is not known to have committed any sexual offenses prior to meeting Norris, himself divulged to Norris that if he were ever to rape a woman, he would kill her so as to not leave a witness to the crime. So you're kind of getting a little foreshadowing in there, finding out a few things. It's almost like they're like uh, feeling each other out, like, okay, listen, I'd fucking murder her after I raped her, though. And he's like, ah. Not a deal breaker for me. That dude, you know, like okay, we're up. keep He's going, putting a toe keep in the going. water. How right. crazy can I get with this right. guy right now? So, uh, when alone, the pair regularly discussed plans to assault and murder teenage girls once they were freed. Uh, this shared fantasy evolved into an elaborate plan to murder one girl of each teenage year from the ages of thirteen to nineteen, like we talked about before. The pair vowed to become reacquainted once they were released. And Bittaker was released from the California men's colony on October 15th, 1978, and returned to Los Angeles and found work as a skilled machinist. So he only did like a year. Uh, well, he, he did in. a year after Norris got in. Yeah, yeah. So he okay. had been in for a little while. I think he had been in since 75, if got I'm it. not mistaken. Um Sorry, sorry. Somebody out there is just like, oh, that's just locker room talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't even worry about that. Like, that's just what so, guys do. So, so, so <laughs> he returned to LA, found work as a skilled machinist. The work earned Bittaker close to $1,000 a week. We're talking 1978, too. Oh, yeah. He's earning 1000 bucks a week. And despite classifying himself as a loner, he became friendly with several people in his neighborhood, earning a reputation as a generous and helpful individual who occasionally donated money to the Salvation Army. What a guy, right? Cover up. It's, it's either that or it's the classic like neighbor being interviewed like, I had no idea. It just always smelled like death. I didn't understand. (laughs) Bittaker was particularly popular amongst the local teenagers. He later admitted the primary reason he always had beer and marijuana in his Burbank motel was that his residence would remain a popular place for teenagers to socialize. You kids like marijuana and cocaine? <laughs> three months <laughs> in my room for you. Three months after Bittaker was released from the California men's colony on January fifteenth, nineteen seventy nine, Norris was released from prison and moved into his mother's home in Redondo Beach. Question number six is multiple choice only for two hundred and fifty points. What job does he get after his release and move to Redondo Beach? Does he become a a tree trimmer in Torrance? B a plumber in Gardena? C, an electrician in Compton, or D, a painter in Inglewood. Tree trimmer in Torrance, plumber in Gardena, electrician in Compton, and painter in Inglewood. 
<laughs> oh, yeah. I got this one. Uh, John thinks it's B, Plumber and Gardena. Jeff thinks it's D, Painter and Inglewood. Right after his release, Roy Norris finds employment as an electrician in Compton. Mm. Sorry, guys. No one's scoring on question number six. We still have... He was artistic with the jewelry. Yeah. Yeah. I figured painter. We got a 500 to 500 tie. There wasn't enough creative expression in his painting apartment buildings in Inglewood, California. He did it as an electrician, (laughs) I guess. So in late February, the pair met at a hotel and rekindled their plan to kidnap and rape girls. In order for the pair to be able to be successful in abducting teenage girls, Bitteker decided they would need a van as opposed to a car. With With or without windows. (laughs) We'll get there. With financial assistance from Norris, Bitteker purchased a silver 1977 GMC cargo van in February of 1979. The vehicle was windowless on the sides and had a large passenger side sliding door. According to Bitteker, when viewing the sliding door, he realized he and Norris could, quote, pull up to a teenage girl real close and not have to open all the doors all the way. Question number seven. Bitteker and Norris would nickname this van. What will that name be? This is multiple choice only as well. This one's going to be for 250 points. Did they name it Murder Mac? The Dungeon on Wheels? The Thunderdome? Or The Van Pyre? A. Murder Mac. B. The Dungeon on Wheels. C. The Thunderdome. And D. The Van Pyre. All right. John takes the Thunderdome. Jeff takes the Van Pyre. Because it sucks the ladies up off the streets like that, you see. <laughs> <laughs> when they buy the van and decide to name it, Bitteker says it looks big like a Mack truck. Murder and Mac. And they name it mm-hmm. Murder Mac. It's just, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's 1970-something crackers. That's what that is. Yeah, but also Mac. it kind of points a little bit to the whole... Just because your IQ is 138 doesn't, yeah, doesn't mean, mean you're, you're intelligent. intelligent. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, it kind of looks like a big Mack truck. I'm going to call it Murder Mack. <laughs> hey, Ray, it's a, it's a Dodge van. <laughs> hey, you shut the hell up. Oh, uh, Ray, you want to go murder some little girls? Yeah, man. <laughs> so uh, he has, they have a few dry runs, you guys. From February to June of 1979, Bitteker and Norris picked up over 20 female hitchhikers. The pair did not assault these girls in any manner. These practice runs were merely a way for them to develop ruses to lure girls into the van voluntarily and of discovering secluded locations. I feel like it's, you don't really ever think about murderers and serial killers practicing. Like, oh, wait, I'm going to kidnap this one and just not kill them first. Apparently, it is a very popular thing. They do. Yeah, I guess, man. Maybe Maybe some of them. I don't have the mind of a serial killer yet. Think about how many serial killers (laughs) there could have been, like, but they just gave up because they're like, man, chicks are crazy. I'm done. (laughs) <laughs> like I can't. Like, what's lady? Get in the van. I have candy and beer. What is I have the tried problem? twenty different ways, and none of them got in. I had a puppy in there, and they were just like, "No, it smells like pee." <laughs> so in late April, the pair discovered a secluded fire road located in the San Gabriel Mountains. Bitteker broke the locked gate to the fire road with a crowbar and replaced it with a lock he owned. This is going to end the dry runs. Let's take a little break right What's here. What's shocking to me is that they've gone all this time without getting arrested for a parole violation. Yeah, they've been out a year and a half. Yeah. I think That's it's like a record. I think they've re- been planning. It's to get, well, you know, I am a better me with my girlfriend. I'll say that much. So, like, if you're with your soulmate, maybe you're just a better person. Hey, uh, I like that. That's and even like, if you are tandem awesome murderer. That's a common people. goal now, too. Like, before, they were just aimlessly just committing crimes. Now it's like, hey, man, team effort. Let's go rape and kill some little girls. Let's be smart about this. And let's do it together. (laughs) Teamwork makes the dream work, guys. You didn't know I brought on uh, Jeff V, the criminal profiler, huh? (laughs) So let's take a quick break right here. Uh, Shit is about to get really fucked. Um, Come back or I'll kill you. Yes. Hey, guys. If you're ever interested in how you could support the show, we just wanted to let you know that Patreon.com slash Serial Chillers Podcast is the way to do it. If you feel like the show deserves anything and any right, if you've ever enjoyed it for even a second, you can give as little as a dollar a month to help the wheels keep on turning. 
Uh, we really appreciate it, and uh, thanks for the support in advance. Patreon.com slash Serial Chillers Podcast. Thank you. No, it's cool. We're rolling again. Okay, welcome back, everybody, to episode 25. We're going to dive right into Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris's crime spree, but we're going to start it with question number eight. I don't know uh, if you remember this, John uh, and Jeff. You wouldn't because you haven't been on the show, but I don't love to throw questions in the middle of murder sprees. It kinda, um, it's a little sad. I like to get through them quicker than shorter. I will be perfectly honest. I did probably bring a little more detail into these murders than I have in ones before, but only because these guys were so fucked. Like it, it felt I would be remiss if I didn't mention some of the things because they are very uh, indicative of who they are and what they are. So um, I guess maybe mini trigger warning. Very I'm so excited right now. <laughs> <laughs> very detailed in these murders. So question number eight, the guys are going to kill women. How many by the time it's said and done? Jeff, you wanted to get a little bit of a lead. It is 750 to 500, or sorry, 500 to 500. You guys have 500 to pop. This question is for 500, and only the closest to the answer is going to receive the points. Okay. Now, there's only price is right rules if you guys split the difference. So, like, let's say the answer was 100, and you said 101, you said 99. You would get it in that ah. case. That's the right. only way it would be prices right rules. So, okay. so only if we are exactly even. If you're exactly even from the answer. Right. Got it. So how many women do they kill by the time it's all said and done? John goes 16. Jeff goes 5. Too bad there's not bonus points for an exact guess because the answer is 5. Oh, man. That's Jeff, not that much. Congratulations. 14 and 19. Remember? Proud they of you. wanted one for every year. He's, <laughs> yeah. He's pretty, no, pretty I get good. that. I don't take notes. I just listen. <laughs> So Jeff scores 500 on question number eight. John skips that one. Jeff is now up 1,000 to 500. Uh, that's painful. Ain't over mm. yet. John, you've got four questions. It's not impossible. We did get through a good chunk of the questions in first segments, though. <clears throat> so Lucinda Lynn Schaefer is going to be their first victim. Bittaker and Norris killed her. She is 16 on June 24th, 1979. Oh. Uh, Schaefer was last seen leaving a Presbyterian church meeting in Redondo Beach. In his written accounts, a lot of what I have here for you guys came from Bittaker's very detailed um, written accounts. So there are a lot of quotes that I'll bring to you. You're going to get a lot of... Um, these guys really want... At least Lawrence Bittaker really wanted to relive these and as a lot of serial killers do they take trophies and um and you'll see a, a little more as we go but he he starts by a, a, a very detailed account of the crimes that they commit so in his written accounts of the events of this day Bittaker stated that he and norris first finished constructing the bed in the back of the van and had installed it in the rear beneath which they had pl uh, beneath which they placed a box full of tools clothes and a cooler filled with beer and soft drinks at approximately 11, it's a fucking party van, dude. Yeah. At approximately 11 a.m., the pair drove to the beach area, drinking beer, smoking grass, and floating, flirting with girls. We had no set routine, said Bittaker. At approximately 7.46 p.m., after trolling for nearly nine hours, Norris spotted Schaefer walking down a side street and remarked to Bittaker, quote, There's a cute little blonde. After unsuccessfully attempting to entice Schaefer into their van with alternate offers of marijuana and a lift home, Bittaker and Norris drove further ahead and parked alongside the driveway. Norris then exited the vehicle, opened the passenger side sliding door, and leaned into the van with his head and shoulders obscured from view behind the door. When Lucinda Schaefer passed the van, Norris exchanged a few words with her before dragging her into the van and closing the door. Using the ruse they would repeat in most of their subsequent murders, Bittaker turned the radio to full volume as Norris bound the victim's arms and legs and gagged her with duct tape as Bittaker drove Schaefer to the fire road in the San Gabriel Mountains, where, like I mentioned before, in April, the pair had previously switched the locks. So at this point, they are the only ones that have access to this road. They've set it up to where three months prior, they gave themselves access to a road that they knew, uh, unless someone else was going to be cutting the lock off, was not getting into. It doesn't get used, you know, this isn't something well-traveled or anything like that. It's, like, even less traveled than very... It doesn't you know, speak to killed. the uh, CDF 
departments there very well. They're checking their fire roads very often. Yeah, I guess not. Not in the San Gabriel <laughs> Mountains in 1979. So, despite initially screaming when she was abducted, Lucinda Schaefer quickly regained her composure. In his written account of that night, uh, Bittaker wrote that Lucinda Schaefer, quote, displayed a magnificent state of self-control and composed acceptance of the conditions of which she had no control. She shed no tears, offended no resistance, and expressed no great concern for her safety. I guess she knew what was coming. Going back to the IQ, that is a very well-written excerpt. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. So, uh, I guess she was very uh, accepting of her fate very early in the situation. And uh, I don't think that for him is exactly what he wanted. Um, At the end of the fire road, Norris first raped Schaefer after instructing Bittaker to take a walk and return in one hour. Upon returning to the van, Bittaker similarly raped the girl in Norris's absence. Upon the second occasion in which she was raped by Norris in Bittaker's absence, Schaefer asked him whether they intended to kill her, to which Norris replied no. In response, Schaefer requested to be allowed time to pray before she was killed if that was what Bittaker and Norris had intended to do. In their subsequent accounts of the actual murder, Bittaker and Norris have given differing accounts as to who argued over whether they should kill her rather than release her. Each stated, as the other argued, that they should kill her. In any event, Schaefer pleaded only a second to... uh, Oh, sorry. She pleaded for only a second to pray before Norris attempted to manually strangle her. After approximately 45 seconds of becoming disturbed at the, quote, look in her eyes, Norris ran to the front of the van, vomiting. Bittaker then manually strangled Schaefer until she collapsed onto the ground and began convulsing. He then twisted a wire coat hanger around her neck with a pair of vice grip pliers until Schaefer's convulsions ceased. Lucinda Schaefer was denied her request to pray before Bittaker and Norris killed her. Lucinda Schaefer's body was wrapped in a plastic shower curtain and thrown over a steep canyon Bittaker had selected prior uh, to this trip. Um, yeah, according to Norris, after Bittaker had thrown Schaefer over the canyon, Bittaker assured him that, quote, the animals would eat her up so there wouldn't be any evidence left. Why bother wrapping her in a plastic bag? I, I'm not sure. I... <laughs> I, you know, if you're going to chuck her in a canyon with the hopes that the animals are going to eat her, why even fucking bother with the back? Maybe it was just a cleanliness thing for them. Yeah, I maybe. don't know. Yeah. Um, one of my... F- that dude puked. Yeah. Yeah, Weak. what a bitch. You can't even kill somebody without... <laughs> oh, I, can't, I can't wait to get... Oh, it's going to be... <laughs> she looks sad. <laughs> well, um, I learned a lot from the BTK murders that it takes a lot... To manually strangle a human because Dennis Rader is a very big man. I'm not you familiar with BTK at all? Big dude, uh, and he like his first attempt at a manual strangulation was like of a 40 year old woman or whatever, and he said that it was really hard and it made him cry. The how gnarly it was. Yeah, I'm gonna show you how easy it is when you get the hook sunk in. <laughs> oh my gosh! So. <laughs> that is their first victim. Their next victim is gonna be Andrea Joy Hall. Two weeks after the murder of Lucinda Schaefer on July 8th, 1979, Bittaker and Norris encountered 18-year-old Andrea Joy Hall hitchhiking along the PCH, or the Pacific Coast Highway for all you non-Californians. We all surf here, by the way. As the pair slowed the van to offer Hall a lift, another vehicle pulled over and offered Hall a ride. You know how pissed were they? They were like, oh, "Oh, we're going to get her. She's hitchhiking? Pull over right here, Roy. And then all of a sudden... Oh, oh, oh man. we were gonna murder her. <laughs> so why uh, I keep I just keep saying they have southern accent. I don't know why. They could probably you assume don't. these didn't. serial killing white guys are total hillbillies? Yeah, you know probably. I mean? Like just I think that's fairish. Is, is it okay? Like I hope I'm not offending anyone by doing I'm so that, triggered. But. Yeah. Are you triggered now? So, so triggered, dude. Oh. So once once she's picked up, Bittaker and Norris do the only reasonable thing and go out and look for somebody else. No, they followed that vehicle from a distance until Hall exited the vehicle in Redondo Beach. They didn't go find somebody else? Oh, no. Oh, they they were on it. They All right, I'm tracking now. Yeah. On this occasion, Norris hid in the back of the van in order to dupe Hall into thinking Bittaker was alone. Inside the van, Bittaker offered Hall a soft drink from the cooler located in the rear of the van. When she retrieved the soft drink, Norris pounced after a strength... Let me just stop for a second. Can you fucking imagine... 
being a hitchhiker, you've gotten a few rides today. They just watched her get a ride. You've gotten a few rides today. And then all of a sudden you can just jump in one more. Maybe your last ride of the day. The kind of evening's winding down. And the guy's like, hey, I got some drinks in the back. You want to go just grab us a couple? And you're like, this is fucking awesome. Like, he's got drinks. Well, she's like, probably thinking like, ah, yeah, I could fuck one of these dudes. It's you a know? newer she van. Only, she only thinks there's one. Remember, yeah. he's hiding oh, in the back. Yeah, and right. then she goes to get it. And he fucking pounces it. Like, he's mm-hmm. hiding in the back. Gah! And jumps out at her. <laughs> like, What's funny is this is in Redondo Beach. And the one guy lives in Redondo Beach. Mm-hmm. That ain't a big place, if any of you guys are familiar with that. Redondo Beach is not a large I'm town. I'm not insanely familiar. We're, we're from I California. Know. Everybody's <laughs> familiar with Redondo Beach. We all surf. The waves are, the curls are awesome. And This is probably pitted. legitimately, like, around the corner from where he's living at this point. You know is it I mean? that it's, small? It's not that small, but it's not big. You know? Yeah. Wow, okay. But you don't hear pounce often either, so that's good wordplay. I like that. Yeah, uh, it's a good <laughs> pounce <So, laughs> Well, the guy had a one newer van. I'd like to point that out, too. So she's probably like, this. these guys that's are... That's true. It's, yeah, it was it's a 77, true. and what, what year are we it's in there? 79. 79, 79 yeah. so it's not that bad. It's probably still pretty clean. It's yeah. silver. Yeah. Right? Uh, I would imagine. I'm thinking most rapey, killy vans are white. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if I'm going to hop in a van unsolicited, I'm going to do it in a nice one, not yeah, a shitty for, van. Of you course. Know? Well, like, I'm, not, yeah, I'm, I'm not saying judge a book by its cover, but if I'm judging a van by its cover, the nicer the better, probably. <laughs> That's at least in Jeff's world. So uh, he, <laughs> she is pounced upon and apparently puts up quite a fight. Um, after the fight, she is finally subdued by twisting her arm behind her back, causing her to scream in pain. Norris then gagged Hall with adhesive tape and bound her wrists and ankles. Bittaker and Norris drove Hall to a location in the San Gabriel Mountains beyond where they had taken Lucinda Schaefer. At this location, she was raped twice by Bittaker and once by Norris. On the second occasion in which Bittaker raped Hall, Norris saw what he believed to be a vehicle headlights approaching. Upon informing Bittaker that uh, he clasped his hand over Hall's mouth and dragged her into nearby bushes as Norris drove in an unsuccessful search of the vehicle he had seen. So they see a car. Can you imagine? I remember like sneaking out as a kid and shitting my goddamn pants when I saw headlights at the end of the street. These guys are up raping and murdering in the mountains and think they see a car coming up their road. Well, imagine how much more difficult it would be to be these type of serial killers in the days of cell phones. You know what I mean? Like if that is a van and they see some or a car coming, they see some random car parked up in the mountains. You're calling the cops like probably immediately. Or at you know least I mean? like snapping a picture or taking a note. Yeah, hell like, yeah. I could never do it in a car because of that. Well, it's they were like doing it every, in the bushes. Every light, every sound, every noise, you think, oh, that's the cops. Or you know, yeah. or it's your, your yeah. parents if you're young, you know. Yeah. I and then the down. windows fog up. It's like Everybody knows what's going on. Right. I phoned down in the parking lot at um, Six Flags one time. It was the most stressful like 10 minutes of my life. You know what I mean? Cause, like, I'm in the back of a Honda Civic Coupe, and it was just horribly stressful. Anytime somebody's walking by, you're just like, oh, fuck. Yeah. You know? And you guys can't see him. John is not a big... A, I'm not like a, a small person. Yeah, you're not a tiny guy either, no. though. Like, yeah, you're, you're not like some huge monster, but the back of a Honda Civic Coupe is not giant. No, it's not my best friend. Home, I'm six foot two, so. <laughs> In case you didn't know. Uh, so, <laughs> moving back on to the rape and murders. He goes out and he looks for the van or the car he thinks that he saw coming up the road in the van. Um, he doesn't find it, and when he returns to the van, or when he returns with the van... Uh, they scoop up Bittaker and the victim and take them up to a location even deeper into the mountains. And Bittaker forced Hall to walk naked up a hill alongside the road, then perform fellatio upon him. Imagine how much trust you have to have in your murdering homie that you let him just take off in the van to go check this out while you're like butt naked in some bushes with some girl That's raping true. her. You know what I mean? Like my first thought in the world is going to be like, hey, if some shit does go down, he's out of here. Right. You know what I mean? And I'm stuck up here in the mountains with some chick probably 20 miles outside of L.A. up in yeah. the San Gabriel Mountains butt naked getting down with this girl. You know what I mean? Like I'm going to have to kill her. I'm going to have to dispose of the body. This guy's going to take off. Yeah. Valid point. Um, more important point, uh, I, how, do you, how do you force, and why would you want to force fellatio? I feel like that would person never. has a yeah an advantage over you at that point. This I mean, Gunner knows they're, they're going this, out. This like, person knows they're dying. Yeah. They're biting down for sure. Yeah, why would you t- force fellatio? I, I think he thinks it's the best option. I think I, for him, it's 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 what he wants. But there's, you wonder if somebody like that has a bargaining chip, like, hey... 
uh, go down on me and I won't kill you. And you that know? and that that could be it because look, Bitteker then ordered Andrea Hall to pose for several Polaroid pictures, and they drove her to a third location where Bitteker again walked her up a hill, and this time Norris drove to a nearby store to purchase alcohol. When Norris returned, Bitteker was alone and in possession of two further Polaroid pictures he had taken of Hall, both of which depicted Hall's face and expressions Norris later described as being of sheer terror. Imagine how unsexy those naked Polaroids are going to be. You have yeah. this chick who's just terrified for her life, probably bawling her eyes out. I don't think first that off, they're looking... she's been hitchhiking for a minute. She's yeah. not clean in the first place, you know? I, I don't think that they want the, your traditional... It's weird. That's what yeah. I have a hard time grasping, like, is how somebody this, finds this that This look sexy. of sheer terror she had in her face as she begged for her life to be spared... That's was, what got them off. Well, that's what, <laughs> for sure, that was Norris's thing. That's what he said. Like, that was my shit. When I could see them... In pure terror, I, that's what got me where I needed to Who's be. Who's in charge? Is there? It's a, very Bitteker. Bitteker is kind of he's kind of running the show. Norris is very. I think he looks up to him a lot. It seems that it he's seems, a little bit older. Uh four Tiny years. Yeah, yeah, four years. But it does seem very big brother, little brother. Maybe mm-hmm. um, the dynamic is very Norris because if you look back, Norris. I don't think Norris ever wanted to kill. I think he just wanted to rape and cause a lot of stress, but mm-hmm. he I don't think he ever wanted to kill him. I mean, he he even told his their first victim, like, we're not gonna kill you. And I don't think it was a bargaining chip because I just think that he thought he could talk and he couldn't finish the murder either. He went yeah. and puked. Mm-hmm. I That's think true. that he thought once it got to it, he could tell Bitteker, like, we don't need to kill her. We're gonna let her go. Yeah, let her go. She's traumatized. She ain't going to tell anybody. And, and, and Bitteker's like, fuck that. Yeah, and I don't think that Bitteker, uh, or I don't think that Norris knew what Bitteker was really capable of. So Bitteker tells Norris that he had informed Hall he intended to kill her and challenged her to give him as many reasons as she could as to why she should be allowed to live. When he decided she didn't have good enough reasons, he killed her by thrusting an ice pick through her ear and into her brain. He then turned her body over and thrust the ice pick into the other ear, stomping on it until the handle of the ice pick was broken. Noting at this point that Andrea Hall was still alive and conscious, Bitteker then manually strangled her to death before throwing her body over a cliff. So savage. It's so savage. Like, and I, I pictured like a Friday the 13th movie or something where you're just yeah. staring at him and he just goes, and it's just, you and know. like just misses your brain enough so that you don't die right away. You know, like that's what's gnarly twice. Yeah. Flips her over, sticks it in again, and then stomps on it mm-hmm. until the handle broke of the ice pick. Yeah, like they're very experienced with like kidnapping and raping women. It's almost like they didn't practice the killing quite enough to be good at it. Right, right. Um, well, he's pretty good at the manual strangling thing. Like, yeah, Bitteker, yes. Bitteker is for sure. Yeah. Um, I think he may have used the wire hanger method on that one mm-hmm. as as well towards the end. Our next victims are going to be Jackie Doris Gilliam and Jacqueline Leah Lamp. Ooh, a twofer. Both Jackies. On September 3rd, 1979, Bitteker and Norris observed two girls named Jackie Doris Gilliam and Jacqueline Leah Lamp sitting on a bus stop bench located close to Hermosa Beach. Lamp and Gilliam had been hitchhiking along the PCH before Bitteker and Norris observed them as they were resting at the bus stop. Bitteker and Norris offered the girls a ride, to which Gilliam and Lamp accepted. Bitteker and Norris offered... Oh, sorry. Yep. Inside the van, both girls were offered marijuana by Norris, which they accepted. Uh, they're 13 and 15, by the way. Um, they take the marijuana because, hey, free marijuana. Kids, uh, this is why you don't get in the car with strangers. Sh- but they might have free marijuana. Where are your parents? Shortly after entering the van, both girls, <laughs> both girls realized that Bitteker had steered the van off of the PCH and was driving in the direction of the San Gabriel Mountains. When the girls protested, both Bitteker and Norris tried to calm the girls' concerns with excuses, which did not deceive either girl. Lamp, age 13, attempted to open the sliding door, whereupon Norris hit her on the back of the head with a sock full of lead weights, briefly knocking her unconscious before overpowering 15-year-old Jackie Gilliam. As he began to bind and gag Gilliam, Jacqueline Lamp regained consciousness and again attempted to flee the van, whereupon Norris twisted her arm behind her back and dragged her into the van. 
As the struggle ensued, Bittaker, noting the girl's struggle was in full view of potential witnesses, stopped the van, punched Gilliam in the face, and assisted Norris in finishing the binding and gagging of the two girls. Gilliam and Lamp were driven to the San Gabriel Mountains, where they were held captive for nearly two days. Being bound and gagged between repeated instances of sexual and physical abuse, both men slept in the van alongside their two hostages, with each alternatively acting as a lookout. So they felt so comfortable. They were probably so stoked to have two that they were sleeping in the van. Um, it's weird to me that they don't use any type of like conventional weapons. You mean like they don't have a gun and a, no, like have a, a big gun, Bowie knife or, or something. Or even like a bat or something. You know, like yeah. he's hitting over it with a sock with lead weights in it. You know what I mean? It's yeah, that's like, true. They don't have, he doesn't have like a... They a, seem ill-prepared for the actual attack. That's right. what's weird to you? It's one of many <laughs> things that are weird to me. You know what? I'm somewhat desensitized to the crazy shit that happens on this show. Yeah. So. John, John has not only been on the show, but we live together. So yeah. we've... Uh, He's he's seen some shit. And the oh, show's so like, this it's fixed is what it is. The, yeah, you didn't the, know that it's fixed. That's why you're winning. Because <laughs> it's collusion, and you have double the amount of points as him. <laughs> All a part of our master plan. He's just fishing for compliments. Don't believe the polls. <laughs> so. Um, uh, on one occasion, Bittaker walked Lamp onto a nearby hill and forced her to pose for pornographic pictures before returning to the van. Bittaker also informed Norris to take several Polaroid pictures of himself and Gilliam, both nude and clothed. In the first of three instances in which Bittaker raped Gilliam, he also created a tape recording of himself raping her, forcing the girl to pretend she was his cousin and informing Gilliam to feel free to express her pain. When we say tape recorder, we're talking just audio. Right. 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 He had a little, you know... Like he wants to listen back to the encounter. That's what I'm saying. Like it, it escalates. At first, it so was you know um, writing detailed journal entries. Then mm-hmm. it was okay. Well, maybe I'll just snap a few Polaroids. And now he's doing now both. I of want those a full things. audio account of this situation. Exactly. And we're talking 1979. I don't think that home video cameras are. Um, it would have been the size of the van. Right, and it would have been probably crazy expensive. It sounds like they might have blown mm-hmm. their wad on this brand new van. So, uh, speaking yeah. of blowing their water, right. what happened so, with these two chicks? So, um, Gilliam has, uh, been raped and th- both men decide that, uh, lamp is not for them. She's a little heavier set and she's not again, by any means, uh, um, overweight even she just looked maybe a little heavier set in the pictures that i saw she looked like a very uh, normal even maybe thin woman but they just for whatever some reason of the tinier little girls for whatever kind of thing right she looked more like a woman is exactly uh, it uh, that was she it. was 15 but looked very womanly she was very um you know, mature she, she, yeah she had mature well, and then right. next to a 13 year old i'm sure as well right with her 13 year old friend yeah uh, so um there we go. In the first three instances in which Bittaker raped Gilliam, he also created a tape recording. So we got that. Uh, Bittaker is also known to have tortured Gilliam by stabbing her breasts with an ice pick and using a vice grip pliers to tear off part of one nipple. Uh, really quickly, take a step back to that tape. He's, Bittaker claimed that he buried the tape in a cemetery and the tape recording of Gilliam's rape has never been found. He's only claimed that he made it. Uh, after almost two days of captivity, Lamp and Gilliam were, in fact, murdered. At Bittaker's subsequent trial, Norris claimed that he suggested that Gilliam be killed quick, as unlike Lamp, she had been largely cooperative throughout the period of her captivity, whereupon Bittaker replied, no, they only die once anyway. So Norris is the guy who's like, and this is the one who, um, he's almost merciful in this. You know what I mean? Like, oh, she's cooperative. Yeah, let's have our phone with her and then kill her quick. Right. Same reason he's the one who, like, didn't want to do the killing in the first place. Right, and I think he's more in the line of he wants... He wants... He doesn't want to kill at all, I don't Mm -mm. think. I think he just wants to really get them fucking scared and hear them scream and And, see the terror in their face and to rape them. And then he wants to let them go and take his chances, I think. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, that's Bittaker's like, dude, no witnesses. hundred percent. That's not what we're doing. Bittaker's like, dude, I've been arrested 15 times. It's a matter of time again. Like, yeah, and that might be cut as many witnesses and, right. uh, pe- leave, all, no, leave no pieces behind, no strings, all that stuff. That you know? is correct. So Bittaker tells Norris that no, they only die once anyway. So Gilliam was struck in each ear with an ice pick and then strangled to death. So he likes 
seems to like this Ice method. Pick. It's a second time. Same way, too. Both ears and then a choke out. Pulling a regular Sharon Stone. After Bittaker had murdered Jackie Gilliam, he then forced Jacqueline Lamp out of the van. Upon exiting the sliding door, Bittaker shouted to her, You wanted to stay a virgin. Now you can die a virgin. And then from behind her, Nora struck her upon the head with a five-pound sledgehammer. Bittaker then strangled Lamp until he believed she had died. When Lamp opened her eyes after the sledgehammer hits and the manual strangulation, Norris again bludgeoned her repeatedly as Bittaker strangled her to death. The bodies of Jackie Gilliam and Jacqueline Lamp were thrown over an embankment and never found. The last victim, number five. So they didn't rape the one. No, she died a virgin. They, they, were, they were not interested in her. They never found the bodies. Not those two. You assume that guys like this are willing to fuck anything. You know? You assume that. I think we assume a lot of things about them that are incorrect. No, I think that it's a very... I think when it comes to serial killers, it's a very, they have a very specific That is correct. I yeah. think Ted, Ted Bundy's was like long, straight brown hair. Like a lot of women in around Florida State during Ted Bundy's kind of reign were chopping their hair off and dying it blonde. Well, like Jeffrey Dahmer was an Asian Right, man. like young Asian men. Yeah. Right, like there's definitely... Uh, the type, yeah. Right. Yeah. Jeffrey Dahmer did have white guys I assume, I guess. I assume when it comes and then, uh, to... A BTK, it was like a family thing. Yeah, right? he, did a, he did a family once and then a... It was mostly old ladies after that oh, because okay. I think it was pretty. I think he realized how tough it was going to be yeah. to take on young. I'm assuming that people who are willing to rape and not just looking to murder, though, like are willing to rape anything. Maybe that's just. I mean, yeah. I don't know. And and again, I think maybe for some, then for some, she's got to be this tall. She's got to have this. She's got to smell like this. She's got to say this to me. I, I don't know. But the last victim is going to be Shirley Lynette Ledford. Did you have something? Go yeah. Ahead. If you're going to go to prison, I mean, you're gonna. I mean, if you, you know what I mean, that, you yeah, get what you're going to get, I would think. Like, yeah, it's, I'm going to go to jail because I'm going to do it right. It's not a bad yeah, I mean, I'm going to get yeah. exactly what I want yeah. out of this. Yeah. You know? So uh, the last victim is going to be Shirley N- Lynette Ledford, and Bittaker and Norris abducted her on Halloween 1979. Uh, so we're recording this one day after this Halloween. This is all so in a is, year. This is all from June to October. Yeah, this is a short span. This is where, done yeah, a little killings. over five months where from the first murder to right now. You wonder if they like itching. You know what I mean? Like, yes, it took five months to kill five people, but that's a lot. That's a long time between them. I feel there, like there's feel like. usually with serial killers a large cooling off period, especially after the first murder. Sometimes decades. They I kill and someone I, and they wait thirty five years before they're back at and it. And I again. imagine that with. Uh, good criminals and good serial killers. These guys don't seem super smart, though, when they're actual crim- they're like criminal history. Right. So I assume they're going to do some stupid shit like, oh, hey, we got one yesterday, but let's go out again tomorrow and find a new one. You know what I mean? Like That's why I guess I think it would make more sense for there to be more killings than just the five. And, and there, we'll kind of get to that, but there may be. There might be. So Shirley Lynette Ledford was uh, picked up by the men on October 31st, 1979. Uh, She was abducted as she stood outside a gas station hitchhiking home from a Halloween party in a suburb of Los Angeles. Investigators believe Ledford accepted a ride home from Bittaker and Norris because she recognized Bittaker as he is known to have frequented the restaurant in which Ledford held a part-time job as a waitress. So he might have leveraged his... They're uh, living lives. Yeah. So they're doing this, and then they're also like, oh yeah, that's lives. what I was about to ask. He's like, still, are they still going to work? members of the he's community? He's still working his one thousand dollar a week machinist job. Norris is kind of uh, doing his uh, painting, his electrician, a, electrician, right? Electrician. Electrician. Um, th- yeah, they they have not been del- because then you look suspicious. Yeah. Then you know, I don't think they wanted to get caught. I think they wanted to go forever. Um, yeah, well, if they wanted to get caught, they're letting them go. All right, they're they're living their lives. Yes, Jeff, good point. Yeah, uh, they they abduct her and they abduct her because they're living lives and they're knowing her. So upon accepting the offer for a lift home and entering the van, Ledford was offered marijuana by Norris, which she refused. Good girl. Bittaker drove the van down a secluded street where Norris drew a knife and bound and gagged Ledford with construction tape. Bittaker then traded places with Norris, who drove in an aimless manner for an in excess of an hour as Bittaker remained with Ledford in the back of the van. After removing the construction tape from the girl's mouth and legs, Bittaker tormented Ledford, initially slapping and mocking her, then beating her with his fists as he repeatedly shouted for her to say something. 
Then, as Shirley Ledford began screaming and shouting, he began to shout back at her to scream louder. As Ledford continued screaming, Bittaker began asking her as he struck her, what's the matter? Don't you like to scream? Let me just stop really quick here. This is the one where they have a tape. He records it. There's a tape. It's been found and all that. I don't know that it exists for like us to go listen to. And I'll be I honest, I don't, not. I'm not interested. I know that they played it during the trial. trial. Um, and you can go, and which I did do this. I felt like hearing it would not be acceptable for me. Uh, but I did read the transcript. It is brutal. The, I, I have a few quotes from it in here just to kind of give you an idea. I left out the worst of it. Uh, Jeff, I'll send you a link. Um, <laughs> it's it, it, it's bad. If you're not even comfortable listening to it, you, you know it's got to be Well, here's bad. the thing for me. <clears throat> Sights are one thing. Sounds are a, a whole mm-hmm. nother. I will compartmentalize the shit out of that video. <laughs> <laughs> So, like I said, I, I don't I don't believe that it exists, uh, but I, I didn't look. Oh, it exists. It, There's it, internet. It exists. You know, there are a lot of a lot of things where you would think that you could for sure find it, but like, like there's a lot of things. Point three percent of the internet exists on Google. The rest of it's all yeah. in links. Oh yeah. Oh, I've done mm-hmm. episodes on the dark net. Do one so, <laughs> so I guess what I was really saying is trigger warning. There's going to be some pretty graphic stuff coming uh, up here. Um, as Ledford continued screaming, Bittaker began asking her, as he struck her, what's the matter? Don't you like to scream? As Shirley Ledford began to cry, she pleaded with Bittaker saying, no, don't touch me. In response, Bittaker again ordered her to scream as loud as she wished. Then he began alternately striking her with a hammer beating her breasts with his fists and torturing her with pliers both between and throughout instances when he raped and sodomized her. So she is just being brutalized. That's a tough way to go. And a lot of it is, I think he just wanted a real good tape. So repeatedly Ledford can be heard pleading for the abuse to cease and making statements such as oh no no that sounds of Bittaker alternately extracting either the sledgehammer or the pliers from the toolbox can be heard on tape he had switched on oh the tape he had switched on after entering the rear of the van Norris later described hearing quote screams constant screams emanating from the rear of the van as I drove Shortly after Norris switched places with Bittaker, he himself switched on the tape recorder, which Bittaker had used to record much of the time he had been in the rear with Ledford. Norris first shouted for Ledford to go ahead and scream or I'll make you scream. In response, Ledford pleaded, I'll scream if you stop hitting me. Then emitted several high-pitched screams as Norris encouraged her to continue until he ordered her to stop. Norris then reached for the sledgehammer as Shirley Ledford, uh, seeing him do this, screamed, Oh no! Norris then struck Ledford upon her left elbow. In response, she informed Norris he had broken her elbow, re- uh, pleading, please don't hit me again. In response, Norris held down her elbow and again raised the sledgehammer as Ledford repeatedly screamed no. Norris then proceeded to strike Ledford 25 consecutive times upon the same elbow with the five-pound sledgehammer before asking her, what are you sniveling about, as she continued to scream and weep. After approximately two hours of captivity, Norris killed Ledford by strangling her with a wire coat hanger, which he tightened with pliers. Ledford did not react much to the act of strangulation, although she died with her eyes open. Bittaker then opted to discard her body on a random lawn in order to view the reaction of the press. So maybe at this point... He's a little bit done. He might be done. Like, this was the... This was his he's, masterpiece, maybe. He's he's wanting the notoriety now. He wants know, somebody to hear his that. tape. Yeah, maybe yep. he doesn't want to be caught. He just needs someone to know. I, I, I'm not sure. But doing the, it in secret just isn't doing it for him anymore. It's yeah. progressed to a point where he needs to be hunted now or maybe at least so. sought after. Uh, Shirley Ledford's body was found by a jogger the following morning, and an autopsy revealed that in addition to having been sexually violated, she had died of strangulation after receiving extensive blunt force trauma to the face, head, breasts, and left elbow, with her olecranon, which is a bone in the elbow, sustaining multiple fractures and being essentially unrecognizable. So he just crushed a bone. Her genitalia and rectum had been torn caused in part by Bittaker having inserted pliers inside her body and pulling. 
In addition, her left hand bore a puncture wound, and a finger on her right hand had been slashed nearly off, and these were likely defensive wounds. Bittaker would later claim the tape recording the pair had created of Shirley Ledford's clear abuse and torture offered nothing other than evidence of a threesome, adding that towards the very end, Shirley Ledford was screaming he and, for he and Norris to kill her. So he was saying, like, oh, it's just a threesome, and at the end, she wanted us to kill her. Well, that's kind of his defense to it. <laughs> so uh, okay. this is this is a quote quote this is a quote by Roy Norris about the tape. He says, "Quote: We've all heard women scream in horror films. Still, we know that no one is really screaming. Why? Simply because an actress can't produce some sounds that convince us that something vile and heinous is happening. If you ever heard that tape, there is just no possible way that you'd not begin to cry and begin trembling. I doubt you could listen to more than a full sixty seconds of it." Um, he, he's, he's, I don't know if that's a challenge or if he's kind of looking back and maybe having a little regret on what he did. Cause this is a quote from 1997. So, you know, we're looking at 18 almost years 18 later, years yeah. later. Yeah. He, maybe he's having a little bit of, uh, I don't know. So question number Spending nine, more than six months in jail finally has gotten to him. Right. You know? Maybe so. So question number nine, after details of the killings emerge, Larry and Roy are given a nickname. What is that nickname? I've got four options for you here. Is it A, the Van Snatchers, B, the Toolbox Killers, C, the Construction Tape Killers, or D, the San Gabriel Forest Murderer? What are the names again? The Van Snatchers, or we should say Snatcher, put a little parentheses with S, Toolbox killer ors, Construction killer ors, or San Gabriel Forest Murderer? Jeff says, B, the toolbox killers. John says, C, the construction tape killers. It is B, the toolbox killers. Sounds about right. Jeff. Yes, sir. Grabs another 250 points. Yes, sir. And takes a 1,250 to 500 lead. John, I do not believe you are still technically mathematically eliminated. I was down to Greg when I came back and won, so I'm just going to say. <laughs> Feeling like, pretty confident. I've been there. in this situation My before. name's Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to take one more break. We'll come back with a thrilling conclusion. <laughs> I'm the champ. All right. Well, we're going to come back here, guys. Conclusion of episode 25 it is the conclusion of Roy Norris and Lawrence Bittaker. In November of 1979, Roy Norris became acquainted with a friend named Jimmy Dalton. Reacquainted, I should say. An old friend. Norris confided in this individual as to his and Bittaker's exploits over the previous five months. In addition to the five murders he and Bittaker had committed, there had been three additional incidences in which he and Bittaker had abducted or attempted to abduct young women who had either successfully escaped or, in one instance, had actually been raped and released. So, there are some ones that we didn't even really fucking know about. Mm -hmm. um, upon hearing Norris's confessions, Dalton... As somebody who is trying to follow his parole, consults his attorney who advised him to inform authorities. Dalton agreed with this assessment, and he and his attorney informed the LAPD, who in turn relayed the two men to the Redondo Police Department. A Redondo, Be a Redondo Beach detective named Paul Bynum was assigned to investigate. Um... Dalton's claims as to Norse's confessions of the murders and attempted abductions and rapes, which had been confined, uh, confided to Dalton, had occurred between June and October. So Bynum's going to look into them. Uh, I think at first Dalton is an ex-con, and he's bringing some information that was told to him by an ex-con. So it doesn't really say that they didn't take him seriously, but I, I get the feeling that there's a little bit of skepticism going on here. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. So Bynum initially noted that Dalton's statements as to Norris's confessions did match reports on file of several teenage girls who had been reported missing over the previous five months. 
In addition, the incident Norris had confided to Dalton, where he claimed he and Bittaker had sprayed mace in the face of a woman who had been who had then been dragged into Bittaker's GMC van and raped by both men, matched a report filed in relation to an incident which occurred on September 30th. In this file report, a young woman named Robin Robeck had mace sprayed in her face before being dragged into a van and raped by two Caucasian men in their mid-30s before being released. Although Robeck had been reported or had reported her abduction and rape to the police, they had been unable to identify her assailants. Um, the de- Detective Bynum dispatched an investigation or an investigator to visit Robin Robeck at her residence in Oregon uh, to show her a series of mug shots. Without hesitation, Robeck positively identified two photos presented to her as the men who kidnapped and raped her on September 30th. The two individuals she identified were Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris. Dun, dun, dun. Right. They're Dicks. getting either sloppy or they just don't care anymore. Yeah, and I couldn't you know? really figure that out either because why he why Bittaker would just let the one. Live. I think it was Norris, but that's what was curious. Oh, like, the one go. Yeah, did he? If Norris didn't do it himself, if Bittaker's there, you imagine that they're gonna make sure that somebody. Or dies. was it like one of those situations where Roy's like, "Hey, take a walk." How and many then, giant silver Dodge vans are driving around back then? Or if maybe this know, maybe is getting. Lot. Uh, Maybe this is getting uh, to the point where Bittaker's really wanting notoriety, so now he's like even to test the waters more is like and, willing to let people. And go. that would have been late. September would have been late in mm-hmm. the in the spree. It would have been. Yeah. The, and then the the detective's like, you know, this kind of sounds like a, a similar case, uh, you know, where she got dragged into a van and raped. Well, it's exactly the same case. Maybe we'll look into this. <laughs> yeah. hey, so it's about time. Wait a minute. It's the same person, yeah. too. Well, it didn't take long. I think there was skepti- skepticism initially, but it did not take long for Bynum to understand that, hey, holy shit, maybe this guy is is telling a little bit. So upon linking Bittaker and Norris to the rape of Robin Robeck, the Hermosa Beach police placed Roy Norris under surveillance. Within days, they had observed him dealing marijuana. Ugh. Um, Giving weed a bad name, too. Uh, what on, a son of a bitch. On November 20th, 1979, Norris was arrested by the Hermosa Beach Police for parole violation. The same day at the Burbank Motel where he resided, Bittaker was arrested for the rape of Robin Robeck. Although Robeck had been able to identify mugshots of Bittaker and Norris in a police lineup, she was unable to... I- she was unable to uh, positively identify her assailants. She was unable to pop, 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 pop. So she saw their photos and said, "Yeah, that's them." But when she saw a lineup of men, she couldn't she pick. She could them not out. pick yeah. them out of the lineup. What I wonder is like, what are the parole violations this guy's getting picked up on? You well, know this what one I mean? was like, like, yeah, the weed. That was Marquana. yeah, yeah. All of the other ones. It's a gateway drug. Parole weed's violations. Serial murder. Were were the other were the other crimes like he was uh, Bittaker was burglarizing and stealing cars so yeah. those were crimes in and of themselves but it was also another crime that he was yeah um, for sure violating his parole as well at the same at the same time so they're just out on parole murdering raping yeah no big deal yeah. no deal and then what he's you, like oh, but he's getting picked up for selling you, what are you in for a uh, ganja yeah. <laughs> Exactly, but I, I murdered five. Hey, but chicks. it's cool. Like I'm, a, I swear I'm a good criminal, dude. I married like five people, or murdered like five people, and got away with it. Yeah. I was gonna say he seems to be pretty into telling people about it at this yeah. point. So, uh, nonetheless, police had observed Norris dealing marijuana, whereas Bittaker had been in possession of drugs at the time of his arrest. So both were held on charges of parole violation. A search of Bittaker's apartment revealed several Polaroid photographs, which were determined as depicting Andrea Joy Hall and Jackie Gilliam both of whom had been reported as missing earlier the same year. Mm. Inside Bittaker's van, investigators discovered a sledgehammer, a plastic bag filled with lead weights, a book detailing how to locate police radio frequencies, a jar of Vaseline, two necklaces later confirmed as belonging to the two victims, and a tape recording of a young woman in obvious distress, screaming and pleading for mercy while in the process of torture and sexual abuse. Uh, Shirley Lynette Ledford. We we know about this. Mm-hmm. The mother of Shirley Lynette Ledford, named by Jimmy Dalton as being one of the women whom Norris had confessed he and Bittaker had killed, identified the voice on the tape as being that of her only daughter. Oh, could How you imagine terrible. having to listen to that shit? Get the fuck out of here with no, that. I don't want to think about that. God. The voices of two men mocking and threatening Shirley Ledford in the process of her torture and abuse were identified as being Roy Norris 
and Lawrence Bitteker. Also found in Bitteker's motel were several bottles of various acidic materials. Investigators would later discover Bitteker planned to use these acidic materials upon their next victim. Inside Norris's apartment, police found a bracelet he had taken from Shirley Ledford's body as a trophy. Also found at the homes of both Bitteker and Norris were Polaroid photos. The photos were of girls and young women. Question number 10. How many different girls and young women were identified in these Polaroid photos? The closest to this answer is going to get 1,000 points. How many? They were identified by using the Polaroids, or they were identified like uh, like obviously hey, not all six hundred of people. these weren't dead. Here, like here's this person, here's this, like yeah, identified as separate individual people. Good news is, is that I could get this wrong and still beat you. Well, there's, there's two three, more there's questions. Two more questions. I, that's what I mean. I'm gonna the next few right. I'm going out. <laughs> he's just this one. He's gonna get yeah, wrong. Sure. All right, you guys got. So guesses? we don't know how many Polaroids there were, but we need and how we need to. But we need, to, but we need to guess how many different women were identified in the Polaroid pictures. It doesn't matter how many there were. There could have been. You know, I, I, I just need to know how many different women that you think were on those Polaroids. Seven. Let's say there were seven thousand Polaroids. How many different women were on those? Eight says John. Fifty-three says Jeff. <laughs> John and Jeff. They find over one thousand photos, and they identify almost five hundred different. Wow. Teenage or young teenage age or young women. See, and I'm thinking they're just taking multiple pictures of the same fucking person over yeah, and over yeah. and over. No, again. I'm thinking they like to just they have yeah. So yeah. it says here. Oh, well, let's give Jeff his points real quick. Yeah, Jeff I think is, now I'm probably mathematically. I eliminated. think you are. So uh, you know, good game, everybody. It's there okay. are no prizes, so sorry. and the points mean nothing. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Who's lying? So um, like uh, almost four year old soccer. Almost yeah. five hundred teenage <laughs> girls and young women. We look. A little better than some bunch ball out here, though. Uh, most of which had apparently been taken at Redondo Beach and Hermosa Beach, with others taken by Bitteker at a Burbank high school. Most of these pictures had been taken without the girl's knowledge or consent. They were sniping. Hmm. This guy's out of high school taking pictures. You can never get away with shit like that nowadays. Yep. Uh, Snapchat, just, they just <laughs> people just voluntarily give it up now. You don't even yeah, have to go true. out to the school. Nope. Like, hey, you want me Snapchat? Here's my boobs. <laughs> From what how, I hear. Is that how easy it is? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not that kind of guy. I'm, I'm a married man. So am I. Um, I wouldn't take the Snapchat. I'm not. <laughs> so after their arrests, we've got the confession of Roy Norris. Ooh. On November 30th, 1979, Norris attended a preliminary hearing in relation to the September 30th rape of Rebecca Robeck. By this stage, Norris was being uh, beginning to display visible signs of stress. At the hearing, Norris waived his Miranda rights before Detective Bynum and Deputy District Attorney Stephen Kay began questioning him, initially in relation to the rape of Robin Robeck, then in relation to the statements given to police by Jimmy Dalton and the evidence recovered from his and Bittaker's residences. Initially, Norris flatly denied any involvement in any murders, rapes, or disappearances. Right? You would, though, right? Hey, we've got some stuff on you about some murders. Like, yeah, fucking right you do. you do. Exactly. Yeah. Always lie Prove first. it. Until you know what I mean, Prove like, it. especially Indeed. in a situation because like they're always this. just like, "Tell me the truth; it'll be easier." No, right. I'm still going to prison, man. Right. Like, like, what are you talking about? In your about? head, you're like, "I killed five fucking women." You're not you know going to go be easy like, on me. Exactly. No, absolutely not. Why what is I lying going to do to me at this point? So, however, Norris, after this, uh, when confronted with the evidence investigators had compiled, <laughs> Norris begins to confess. Well, yeah, at that point, you're like, all right, so you guys weren't bluffing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and what Bynum and Kay you later described as, quote, casual, unconcerned manner, Norris divulged that he and Bittaker had been in the habit of driving around uh, and doing the things that they had done. We don't even, I mean, it, I kind of wrote it out again, but we know what they did. They drove around and they did their things. And he pretty much admits that they're driving around the PCH, randomly approaching girls whom they found attractive and offer a ride, posing uh, for photographs and marijuana. 
Uh, most of the girls they had approached rejected whatever given ruse Bittaker and Norris used to entice them in the van, although four girls had accepted lifts from the pair and had been murdered, with a fake victim their first being grabbed by force. So he, he gives it all up. Think of the women that are, the stories coming out, and they were just around there, and they're like, those guys tried to pick me up. Yep. I think there were a few that came forward. And we're just like, wow, like, what a time not to get in the truck. You know what exactly. I mean? What a time. Exactly. So Imagine if it was 2017, there would have been like 10,000 that came forward just to try to get money out of it. Maybe so. You might be right. So Norris makes admissions about a lot of what he's done. According to Norris, the level of brutality Bittaker had exhibited towards their victims had increased on each successive instance. Call this escalation. Shirley Ledford had actually pleaded to be killed in order to that her agony could be ended. Uh, additional details provided by Norris provided further corroborating evidence to support his confessions. In a press statement relating to the police investigation into the murders issued on February 7, 1980, Los Angeles County Police Sheriff Peter Pitches said, quote, The victims had been subjected to sadistic and barbaric abuse adding that five charges of first-degree murder would be sought against both Bittaker and Norris. Sheriff Pitches also stated that in relation to the Polaroid pictures found in Bittaker and Norris's apartments, police had located 60 of the young women depicted, none of whom had been harmed. So they're starting to kind of locate and track down some of these women they found in these photos because... Make sure they're still alive. Yeah, exactly. Nonetheless, Pitches also stated that they had identified 19 of the women depicted in the pictures as being individuals who had been reported missing and that these teenage girls and young women may well have been murdered, although Pitches did stress that he had no conclusive evidence to suggest that these additional 19 women photographed had fallen victim to Bittaker and Norris. He's just making them... He's pointing something out here. One of these individuals depicted in the Polaroid pictures seized from Bittaker and... Uh, oh, sorry, lost my spot. It's weird at this point that they're not like I mean they're caught, you know, they're right. they're going to prison hopefully for life. And at this point it's weird that they're not coming through and be like, "Oh, by the way, we didn't just kill five people. We also kidnapped 30 others and yada yada." The Henry Lee Lucas. Yeah. Henry Lee Lucas may have admitted mm -hmm. to several murders that he really had just nothing to do with. So, yeah. um <clears throat> Uh, one of the individuals depicted in the Polaroid picture seized from Bittaker and Norris's depicts an unidentified young white woman alone with Bittaker and Norris in circumstances very similar to the pictures found depicting known victims, Andrea Hall and Jacqueline Leah Lamp and Jackie Gilliam. The young woman in the picture has never been identified. Investigators believe this individual, individual is most likely of all of those photographed who may have been murdered by Bittaker and Norris that we don't know about. On March 18, 1980, Roy Norris pleaded guilty to four counts of first-degree murder, one count of second-degree murder in relation to the victim of Andrea Joy Hall, two counts of rape, and one of robbery. Formal sentencing was postponed until May 7th. In return for Norris's agreeing to plead guilty and testify against Lawrence, uh, at his upcoming trial, prosecutors agreed to seek neither the death penalty nor life without parole in the upcoming sentencing hearing. Uh, so, as you know, they can make these deals and pull back. They don't have to. Mm -hmm. But they, that's what they tell them. What's crazy is to think, like, my buddy's mom would have been, like, 18 years old in Redondo Beach at this time. You know what I mean? Like, that she, shit's crazy. You should ask her if she knew anything. You know? Or she she probably knows all about this thing. Oh, yeah. She probably is very aware of this What situation. if she got approached at the same that's, time? That's what, what I'm saying. You know, like, this should be get crazy. Ask her, I'll interview her. Prior to his May 7th sentencing, Norris was reviewed by a probation officer with regards to advising the court as to Norris's possible future parole. This probation officer testified at Norris's sentencing that in his conversations with Norris, Norris again accused Bittaker of committing the actual torture of their victims, and Norris also stating that in the rapes and murders he had committed, the actual act of sexual intercourse was not the overriding factor, but the act of domination in the women. The parole officer added that Norris, quote, never exhibited any remorse or compassion about his brutal, hideous behavior towards the victims. The defendant appears compulsive in his need and desire to inflict pain and torture upon women, end quote. So this is what um, some... Uh, his probation officer is coming in and like saying like, I had a few talks to them and this is their deciding factor as to whether they're going to offer him parole during his sentencing. 
you're going to fucking parole this guy. You know what I mean? Well, like, they had to give him hearings. I mean, they give yeah, Manson hearings, sure. yeah, so they're not going to ever let him out, but he's got to, you know. In conclusion, the probation officer testified that he can um, be realistically regarded as an extreme sociopath whose depraved, grotesque pattern of behavior is beyond rehabilitation. It's about fucking time somebody realized that I would, shit. I would concur. Yes. So on May 7th, 1980, Roy Norris was indeed sentenced. Question number 11. We'll do them anyway. What is Roy's sentence? Is it A, the death penalty? B, 45 years, no parole? C, 45 years with parole? Or D, life with no parole? You can just shout them out since we're kind of... I would say 45 years with parole. They gave him 45 and parole. Yeah. Uh, life, no parole. So you think that they go in life, you think they stuck to their promise, gave mm-hmm. him the 45 and a chance of parole. Yep. So on this date, he is given 45 years to life with parole eligibility in 2010. In 2010, he was denied, but may reapply in 2020. Crazy. So he can reapply for parole every 10 years from here on out. He's, he's not getting out. Um, but how yes, old is this guy? He'll be in 20, 72 in years 20, old. In 2020, he'll be 76. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, the arraignment of... So, yeah, that's the story, hon. That's the, all we're going to talk about Roy Norris. So it's all Bitteker from here on out. So goodbye, Roy Norris. He's locked up for a goddamn ever. And he probably... I mean, it's three years Where away. Where is he in prison? I uh, want to say they are both in San Quentin on mm. different wings. Oh, right. Man. Let them be together. Separated from their homie. Yeah. Uh, the arraignment of Bitteker goes like this. On April 24th, 1980, Lawrence Bitteker was arraigned on a total of 29 charges of kidnapping, rape, sodomy, and murder, in addition to various charges of criminal conspiracy and possession of a firearm. He was also charged with two counts of conspiracy to commit murder, dating from December 1979, in which he had unsuccessfully attempted to persuade two inmates due to be released to murder Robin Robeck in order to prevent her from testifying against him in his upcoming trial. When asked by William Judge Hollingsworth as to how he pleaded, Bitteker remained silent, refusing to answer any questions. In response, the judge entered a plea of not guilty on his behalf. Let's head to the trial, guys. In the trial of Lawrence Bitteker, it begins January 19th, 1981. The star witness to appear for the prosecution of the trial is going to be... Roy Norris. Norris testifies as to how he became acquainted with Bitteker in jail and how they made plans together. He then chronologically recounts the court for details of everything. Uh, He does not shy away from much. Several witnesses testify as uh, to Bitteker having shown them pictures of victims that he had retained as keepsakes, which had been found in his motel. The defense contended that Norris was the actual perpetrator of the murders and that Bitteker had only become aware of Norris's activities shortly after his arrest. So they're saying like Bitteker's defense saying like, dude, they didn't know any, what? Mm-hmm. he was killing people. He had no idea. <laughs> um, he that, was murdering people. Yeah. That seems kind of silly, right? Like they're out doing a rampage together. Yeah. I mean, I get it. One person goes down. It's like, Hey, yeah. No sense for both of us to go down for the same thing, maybe, you know, like I, I can understand the mindset, but so Bittaker says he finds out when Norris informs him that he had murdered several girls with whom they had encountered and engaged in sexual activities. To support their case, the defense produced a friend of Norris named Richard Shoopman, who testified as to Norris's repeatedly divulging in him his desire to rape young girls. Shirley Lynette Ledford the audio recording of her abuse at Bittaker's hands was the most damning evidence presented at his trial. Presented at his trial was the 17-minute section of the audio tape. I think it's 90 minutes long, the actual audio tape. It was a 17-minute section of the audio tape the pair had created of Shirley Lynette Ledford's abuse and torment. I'm going to show you guys a little clip here. This is just like a news clip of them talking about people listening to this, as well as... Um, You'll you'll hear Bittaker's voice a little and some of his responses. He's kind of a piece of shit, hmm. but we already you're knew just that. now figuring that. Well, <laughs> j- just in case we need to. In case you, you didn't think he was a piece of shit. Ever use an ice pick? No, sir. You struck Miss Lamp with a sledgehammer. 
you recall the sledgehammer which was introduced? Yes, sir, I recall it. Uh, was that true? No, sir. Lawrence Bittaker, with an IQ of 138, dragged high school girls into his van, then murdered them by twisting a coat hanger around their throat with a pair of pliers. When his tape recording of one murder was played in court, hear it. Listen. people rushed outside and vomited. You can hear the screaming in the court. Oh, yeah. They touched Miss Ledford on the breast with the cold metal pliers. And if you listen to the tape, you'll hear those tire pliers being replaced in the toolbox a few seconds later. Oh, what, what did you touch her on the breast for with a pair of pliers? To shock her with the cold metal. So... I think there's just nothing but holes in his stories. and uh, that, How ridiculous is that? They just played that video where people you saw were literally coming out of a courtroom All to I did vomit. Was touch cold pliers on her. I was just trying to shock her with the cold metal. She has fibromyalgia. She's extremely <laughs> sensitive. <laughs> so the 17 minute tape, very damning. The audio tape had been found inside Bittaker's van, in which Norris had earlier testified Bittaker had repeatedly played as he drove in the weeks prior to his arrest, adding that Bittaker considered the contents to be, quote, real funny, end quote. Uh, it was presented in evidence on January 29th, and Stephen K. Uh, forewarning the jury, quote, for those of you who do not know what hell is like, you are about to find out, end quote. More than 100 people were present in the courtroom as the tape was played, and many members of both the jury and audience were openly upon hearing the contents with several members of the audience either burying their heads in their hands, daubing tears from their eyes, or rushing out of the courtroom before the tape had even finished. Bittaker was undisturbed at hearing the contents of the tape, smiling throughout the hearing of the recording. You ever wonder, like, how strong your stomach is? Like, if you had to be in a courtroom listening to that shit, like, would you be one of the people running out, throwing up, or would you just be like, yeah, yeah I don't sucks. know. I think it would for sure bum me out. I don't know that I'd puke, mm-hmm. though. I don't think no. that it would get me there. And I'd one, just shut it out. Yeah. In one of two instances throughout the trial when prosecutor Stephen Kay was reduced to tears, saying the reporters outside, everybody who has heard that tape has had it affect their lives. I just picture those girls and how alone they were when they died. End quote. When questioned by reporters as to whether the audio tape should have been introduced into evidence, given the obvious psychological and emotional trauma caused to many in the courtroom through its contents being broadcast, Kay simply stated, You're darn right it should have been. The jury needs to know what these guys did. I can, I can see that. Yeah. So on February 5th, I don't disagree. 1981, Bittaker testified on his own behalf and makes kind of some of those excuses like we heard. I mean, there was... Four paragraphs of the excuses that he made. I don't really want to dive into him. He's a fuckbag. Uh, Bittaker's trial lasted for over three weeks. And on February 10th, 1981, the prosecution and defense counsels began their closing arguments. Closing arguments last four days. And the trial ends Valentine's Day, 1981. On February 17th, 1981, after deliberating for three days, the jury found Bittaker guilty on five counts of first-degree murder, one charge of conspiracy to commit first-degree murder, Five charges of kidnapping, nine charges of rape, two charges of forcible oral copulation, one charge of sodomy, and three charges of unlawful possession of a firearm. How the fuck does it take you multiple days to debate if somebody's guilty? About I've that never shit? been on a jury, and and you know, like you see some where it's like, hey, it took six hours. It only took six hours to deliberate. Even I feel like then, it would take me thirty seconds to know that. Yeah, but there's ten guilty. other people or nine yeah. other people in that. You know what I mean? And eleven. Eleven. That's right. It's twelve. Free lunch. Uh, yeah, free lunch. Uh, <laughs> if it's a real high profile, you might get put in a hotel. Mm-hmm. Now it's like fourteen dollars a day to yeah. serve yeah. on jury All duty. Them. So yeah, I mean, there's eleven different people with eleven very probably different views. Um, doesn't mean that they don't all agree with that he did it. Just maybe there's you know there's other things they yeah. must consider. I don't know, but they come back with. Uh, the deliberations as to whether he had been... Oh, so, yeah, he is, he is guilty of all of them. Uh, deliberations as to whether Bittaker should be sentenced to death or life without parole began February 19th. This is the last question. It's a 50-50 for 500 points. Did he get death or life without parole? Life without parole. Death. The jury deliberated for just 90 minutes before they returned with their verdict. Bittaker was sentenced to death for the five counts of first-degree murder upon which the prosecution had sought this penalty. But you said he's still in prison. 
right now. It's California. It's California, bro. Yeah, that's, that's what I was just checking. Anybody. Yeah. yeah. They um, mean like, you have to die one day, okay? <laughs> yeah. We're going to watch you do it. I command death, it. And that, feed you and clean the, you. That's the death row in California. Sure, it's going to cost $7 million <laughs> yeah, over the exactly. course of your life to care for you. But... So... He showed no emotion when the verdict was delivered. Superior Court Judge Thomas Fredericks then ordered Bittaker to appear in court on March 24th for formal sentencing. Um, on March 24th, in accordance with the recommendation of jury, Lawrence Bittaker was formally sentenced to death. In the event that the sentence imposed was ever reverted to life imprisonment, Judge Thomas Fredericks imposed an alternate sentence of 199 years, four months imprisonment, to take immediate effect. Do you know why they do that? Like, tell people you have, like, oh, three consecutive life sentences or 199 years and shit like that? Because, like, a lot of times, I guess, people will appeal stuff. And, and so that way, if they appeal, appeal one charge that would have been a 10-year sentence, well, you're still fucked. Yeah. You know, and things like that. Like, God forbid you should get, you know, found not guilty of something after an appeal. You're still in prison for life. Yep. So as of today, Lawrence Bittaker remains incarcerated on death row at San Quentin State Prison. What if it was like three life sentences means like you have to serve a life sentence. Your kid has to serve a Dang. life sentence. It's a multi-generational life, life sentence. It's just like next of kin and shit. <laughs> you... Fucked up so bad. We don't want anything else happening. None of your offspring like, are allowed to never. live out their lives. The only yeah, they reason they're allowed to live there. is to have another one to serve the sentence. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's going to wrap it up on Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris, the toolbox killers. You seem like good guys. Yeah, so thank you, John. I destroyed for, you. <laughs> for coming out late night. Uh, Jeff did, in fact, destroy John. Congratulations, yes. Jeff, for Thank showing you. up and getting a victory on your first time out. He I got a victory my first time, too. So so. <laughs> <laughs> I remember what my first beer is like. I've got a little competition sheen going on right now. All right. Thank you, as always, to Hella Greg, even though he sat across the internet and didn't have to do anything tonight. That's the perfect job in his world, and uh, we appreciate that. Did you have fun tonight, Greg? Happy to help. I'm glad you were here. Well, I'm always happy to be a part of it. Perfect. It was good to not meet you. <laughs> yeah. That's mostly what they say. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Greg, you got anything you want to add before we jump out of here? Uh, no, good win, though. Good win. Thank Real you, proud. Sir. Thank you. All right. Well, thank Next you, everybody, time. so much for listening. Thank you to John, Jeff, and Greg for hanging out late night with me. And thank you guys for listening to episode 25 of the Serial Chillers podcast. All right, that was episode 25. Thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, these stories were very brutal, and honestly, I didn't expect them to be so bad since I wasn't very familiar with the duo's infamy. Um, I guess generally when I haven't heard of them, it wasn't that brutal, and, I, and in this case, I was very wrong. So very wrong of me to assume. I will not do that again. Now we know. Congrats to Jeff on his victory over John. John does seem to think that this was beginner's luck, though, Jeff. So maybe I'll have to have you guys both return and duke it out against one another now that you're seasoned veterans on the show. So if there are any cool stories or facts or anything about the toolbox killers that I omitted or that I got completely incorrect and you guys want to correct me or add to the show, please reach out to me. There are so many different ways to do that. You can send me a message or comment over on the Facebook page. It's Serial Chillers Podcast. The Instagram page is at Serial Chillers Podcast. Twitter is at Chillers Podcast. The email is Serial Chillers Podcast at gmail.com. You can call or text the phone number at 1 805 666 2513. If you just want to text the podcast, you can do that. 1 805 666 2513. And last, and probably most importantly, the Patreon, patreon.com slash Serial Chillers Podcast. You've heard the spiel by now. You can give as little as a dollar a month to help the show keep on going. And we plan on going. So thanks to everybody who's already given. Thanks to the people that are thinking about giving. Uh, all of today's research came from... Uh, we had a Radford University timeline, which was researched and summarized by Marcy Chojnacki and Ellen Dans. I used Murderpedia, an article from thecrimelibrary.com, a pocketbook edition of Ronald Kessler's The FBI, and Ronald Markman and Dominic Bosco's book, Alone with the Devil, Famous Cases of Courtroom Psychiatrist. Um, 
I did not. I used these excerpts from the Murderpedia and also in a Los Angeles Times and Herald Examiner article. Um, used the classic Toolbox Killers Wikipedia and watched the documentary Wicked Attraction from Investigation Discovery in 2009. Any music you've heard on the show was done by either myself or Producer Greg. If you want to hear any more from Producer Greg's music, that's soundcloud.com slash And remember, at the end of the day, don't talk to strangers. <laughs>